Now, when did the blindfold start? Somebody on the production team just wanted to see what the difference would be with our walkthroughs if they put me and, Cl uh, me and uh, Chip both in blindfolds. I felt so liberated by that blindfold. I'm a very perceptive person. I go into places and I take in all of the stuff. I've got a fairly good working knowledge of things that you wouldn't think can skew your read for a haunting. But like you walk into a house and you see people's pictures on the walls and people put their lives right out there. There's so much information that you can read without meaning to read. Taking my eyes away meant that I was not self-editing. The one that really I mean, knocked my socks off was, uh, I'm in the blindfold, we're in this house. Hey everybody, my name is Misty Gaither and welcome to Quest a journey into true crime and the paranormal. I'm excited and I know I you know, say that just about every week, how excited I am to have this guest or that guest. Tonight, I'm extremely excited because I have with me Michelle Belanger. Is that how you say it? Is that pretty close or? That's close enough. Okay. <laughs> or <laughs> Michelle B. No. Yeah. Bel Bel Belanger. Oh, Belanger. Belanger, that's it, Belanger. Yeah. yeah. I'll wonder uh, if you've got a strong American accent, and I'm not picky. Okay, well, I have this country hick accent, so I don't know. I, I try. That's all I can do is just try to, to pronounce it the best way I can. But uh, they are a, a psychic vampire author, and I found out recently singer, and just all around very cool. And so I was so excited uh, when you agreed to be on the show, and I feel real honored. Uh, let's let's go back to when I first discovered you. This was back in, I would say, 2007, and it started off with Paranormal State, which I know uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with. And so tell us about how that started. Long ago in the Stone Age, uh, <laughs> the folks at Penn State University who were the Paranormal Research Society, they were a student group, they ran the largest like indoor paranormal convention uh, in, in the US and it was called UNIVCON. Uh, at that point in time, I had several books published on psychic development, psychic abilities, psychic vampires, dream walking, a bunch of different topics. And in 2006, they asked me to come out and be a guest of honor uh, as part of the lineup with, let me see, who did, I got to meet that year Lorraine Warren, wow. uh, Dr. Hans Holzer, who was just the sweetest little son of a I've got a whole ton of other people, like Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson were there. It, it's, it's just like a laundry list of people that we recognize as paranormal elite now. Um, just all hanging out. It was the time when the PRS folks had just been signed to a &E's Paranormal State. Uh, and. I got asked to be uh, actually a researcher behind the scenes. I, I wasn't going to be on camera at first. I was just kind of support. So like, I remember one time where I was in Michigan working on a tarot deck with a, an art, artist friend and I get this weird call from Elfie Music and they're in the middle of backwoods, Maine. They've got Lorraine Warren stomping around the woods with them in a linen skirt and her little heeled <laughs> shoes. And they want me to do like, if people are familiar with Supernatural, I was Bobby minus the alcoholism. So they like, like call up and be like, hey, there's like this thing happening and that thing happening. And there's like, you know, this like maybe like local legend. Could you with your enormous like research library tell us where to kind of maybe look for what's actually going on here. So I'm like, okay, well, like Micmac, da, 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 da. I'm not an expert on Native American stuff, but like all the stuff that you're describing kind of hits this. So see if you could find a local tribal elder to go talk to and off they went. So anytime you have like the Native American and whenever somebody says, you know, there was Native Americans here or whatever, I'm like, here we go, you know, because it's always oh, going to be just rich with such uh, paranormal things. I think it's really important to like, find the people who are an expert on the thing. So like I've got a library of about 5,000 books um, of just occult, paranormal, magical topics, folklore, you name it. Um, my degrees in comparative religious studies with a concentration in psychology or religion. So like 
what I got called on to do was to kind of like hear what they were experiencing, what the people were talking about and go, that sounds like this thing I read. Here's either me as the expert or here's where you should look for an expert to tell you what might be going on. I actually was known for writing books and had been teaching classes in psychic development for, for several years at that point, um, actually got over a decade. And somehow, uh, it's funny how like we wear different hats and it's, it's people will get to know you for one hat, but not realize that you wear others. Like there are people who follow me only for my music and there are people who follow me only for the fiction that I write. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who only know that I'm on Paranormal State, not that I ever wrote books. So long story short, the Paranormal Research Society folks didn't necessarily know that I did psychic work until I got called out initially to help Elfie on camera uh, do research, basically to be like her occult research mentor. Um, Elfie was struggling at the time. She had lost her father and her brother in rapid succession. And now she's like this shy, introverted, like amazing person, but like not necessarily comfortable on camera on a good day, but she's dealing with a lot. So they thought having a study buddy would help her. Right. <clears throat> so that's what they brought me out for. Um, it was the episode that is now known as The Messenger. And it was in, I think, Gold Beach, Oregon. Uh, so I got flown out. There were flying delays. There was a whole bunch of different like things that just kept us from getting on set uh, at this private residence. So. Chip and I, and one of the production assistants, uh, were like the last to arrive. We took a wrong turn on a logging road mm. that took us like 52 miles out of our way. Like it was a very long, long turn. It was a harrowing long turn. And in the course of it, Chip recognized that like, I kept calling out like, hey, don't turn here or hey, don't do this. He's like, are you psychic? And I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> so once we show up, I'm supposed to just do occult stuff uh, as, a, as a research buddy, but Chip actually says, hey, what if I do my walkthrough and you keep, you know, Michelle over here uh, and then you chuck Michelle into the house and see where we match up. Mm. And uh, that was really cool, honestly, yeah. because without, you know, sight unseen of what he had picked up, sight unseen of the house, this was before the blindfold for either of us. Uh, and learning that we both hit on some very specific locations in the house, uh, the way we interpreted our impressions, you know, we're very in tune with our personalities, but still the information was the same. Uh, and thereafter, I was a psychic medium on Paranormal State. <laughs> well, you know what episode really sticks out to me? of, uh, And I just recently watched it again, and I was like, yep, and that's what really, um, you know, I was like, you know, they have it. It's, it's just amazing. And that was the glove episode. Mm. Yeah. Come on, wife beater. Yeah. That one. Oh yeah. When, when you did that and you were like, uh, come on, wife beater, uh, you know, like just calling that person out. And and uh, then y'all went back for a part two. But on the, yeah. uh, the first one, I mean, the light started falling and, and everything when you had uh, called, you know, called that spirit out. There was so much that didn't even make it onto like the final cut for the episode. There was a point where we were standing downstairs around the table, kind of having a huddle and both Josh Light and I, something like yanked on the back of our shirts as we were talking about, you know, our theories for what this entity was. Uh, Cause I know the family initially was worried that maybe it was demonic. Maybe it was like some sort of negative, you know, inhuman thing. But I fell firmly on the, no, this is, this is like, this is a human, this is a relative just someone who never stopped being a horrible person just right. because they're dead doesn't mean they stopped like this guy needed a lot of therapy in life and he certainly didn't get it in death right um and he definitely was uh misogynist he he acted up against anybody he perceived to be uh female and i wasn't having any of it <laughs> oh yeah you stood your ground and that just really impressed me uh, because if you think about it, back in that time of 2007, I mean, we had ghost hunters that came on about 2004, okay? Then Paranormal State started around uh, 2007, and that was even before Ghost Adventures began. So we basically had ghost uh, hunters and Paranormal State. So it was like, 
a kind of a learning um, experience for a lot of people too that maybe had been interested in the paranormal but really you couldn't you know you didn't see a lot of it on mainstream and on TV and so you know to have that and it just really opened doors and it opened just so many different avenues well and ghost hunters because they were on sci-fi and sort of like their approach they really didn't work with uh the, the more spiritual or psychic aspect of things and paranormal state although like we made a point of presenting the skeptical you know sidebar of you know i would insist on even if I did a psychic reading, double check. Like, don't assume, because I think that there's a ghost standing over in the corner that there always is going to be like, use that as like a psychic bloodhound mm -hmm. and point all of the equipment that way and see if we all converge. But it was one of the first places where you could have conversations about, there are some people who can pick this stuff up uh, you know, it's not like, you know, weird, mystical, like like it's an ability a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of the private hauntings that we investigated on that show often came down to the fact that at least one family member was sensitive and just didn't have the training or the knowledge to really put into context what they were experiencing. And it was taking a situation that might not have been bad and making it scary simply because it was unknown. Now, when did the blindfold start? There was an episode, I think it was following the, the Conneaut Lake one, uh, behind the scenes they were talking about um, you know, interesting theories about the paranormal, including the idea of like thought forms where like some hauntings aren't spirits at all, they're things that are projected by the people. Yes. Uh, and somebody on the production team just wanted to see what the difference would be with our walkthroughs if they put me and, Cl uh, me and um, Chip both in blindfolds. And Chip really wasn't a fan of the blindfold. I felt so liberated uh, by that blindfold because, so I am, I'm a very perceptive person. I go into places and I take in, uh, you know, all of the stuff. I've got a fairly good working knowledge of th things that you wouldn't think can skew your read for a haunting, but uh, architecture and like old clothing styles and like you walk into a house and you see people's pictures on the walls and people put their lives right out there there's so much information that you can read without meaning to read like basically you're being front loaded without intending to be right. uh, so taking my eyes away meant that i was not self-editing uh, I remember explicitly there had been one where I walked in and I'm like, I kept picturing a little boy and he was blonde and he had a certain look. Uh, but then I like, I looked over my shoulder and I saw that there was a photo that looked an awful lot like it. And I was like, well, did I see the photo before I had this image in my head? Or is the photo, I, and, and I had no way to know. The one that really, I mean, knocked my socks off was, uh, I'm in the blindfold, we're in this house it, it was, I forget the name of the episode, three played some role in the episode uh, because there were three daughters. Hmm. And I'm describing the people in this house. And when I see the episode, Ryan has moved me in front of the family wall of photos as I, in my blindfold, am describing all of the people in the house. Amazing. <laughs> and like, without knowing it, like he's like pointing at them as I am describing. And you can see them like, you know, kind of like making faces at each other and trying to like, you know, not not just kind of like laugh or be like, how the hell? How? how right, how? right. One of my favorite episodes, I believe this happened with you with the blindfold. I believe it was on Portals to Hell. And it was it was like a private house, I believe. And it had a church across the, the street of the road oh. from it. And they, they put you, you know, you're still in the blindfold. And they put you in a truck or a van and then they take you and drive you around and pull you up across the road. And of course you didn't know about it. And then you came out and you were just like, just spot on with everything. And it was just amazing. And it really impressed me. I do what I do on the shows, partly because it's, it's an exploration for me. Like I've had these abilities since I was tiny. I grew up in a family where it wasn't forbidden like it was stuff that like it ran in the family people talked about it uh but i also you know had a 35 on the act and like science like like i like science i'm not a science doesn't work kind of person so the scientific part of my brain is like how though like seriously how you know this this shouldn't work based on what i was taught in school 
but also my experience tells me something's going on. So how can I, you know, it's not like I'm going to ever have access to like a full on lab. Um, although I did get a chance to go to the Wright Institute once. Um, oh yeah. But, but like in the field, like how do I find ways to put it to the test as much as I can? Uh, to get a good sense in like in my interior experience like how does this work how does this feel right because that really you know like I said it really impressed me because you have to be so sure of yourself and your gifts and you know especially if, if you're you know doing that on tv or wherever just wherever but especially with that you know many eyes and everything on you and because when you're a, a psychic medium a, you know a psychic it is you know your reputation is a lot you know, and then a quote that you said, uh, anyone can be a psychic after the fact. You know, it's yeah. easy for someone like to be a what? Do, what do they call it? The armchair, uh, you know, like <laughs> yeah. the quarterback, and armchair I psychic. I had a dream about that. Totally. Oh yeah. I never wrote it down. I have no record of it, but I'm totally sorry. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Or, or wait, I was about to say, you know, and I yeah. guess that's why that you know you have to be sure of yourself and say it. It, weirdly, what helped a lot with it is I was in goth and metal bands in the 90s and the early 2000s and, you know, toured and you get up on stage and you're dressed up in like, you know, wild, wacky costumes and you're just, you know, having fun, whether you're playing to 50 people or 500 people. And it, you have to just hit a point where you're doing it for yourself and you're not thinking about anybody around you watching you. Uh, and that is how... I do the readings with any of the paranormal shows. Like I just do it for me. Um, maybe there's people around me. I do like, it doesn't even cross my mind anymore that there are people watching. I just get into the zone and whatever happens happens. Right. Um, and I try not to go in with any expectation that I'm going to be wrong or right, or that it looks silly uh, because the instant you start self editing, like doubting, like, Oh, that's good. That's going to seem really weird. You hold back everything in the past, what, how many decades have I been doing this? Like, paranormal, what, nearly 20 years now with Paranormal State. Uh, every time I held back something that I thought was just too weird to say, it turned out to be really spot on. And I know Katrina Weidman has, has mentioned that like, as, a, as time has gone on, I've gotten more accurate. I'm like, no, I've just gotten more, less edited. Yes. Like I, I stopped going, well, this is going to make me look like I'm like really off. Um, and I just rattle off whatever. Yeah. So tell me about Oberlin, Ohio. It is uh, a, a fun little corner of the world. Uh, I have a haunted Airbnb in Oberlin. Uh, it, we didn't start off with the intention of renting an Airbnb because it was haunted. Um, I was looking before the pandemic for a place where I could do like little weekend retreats and like, you know, kind of intensive classes. I teach psychic development and self-protection and, and dream walking and a bunch of things like that. Uh, but then the pandemic happened and made in-person stuff, especially in the 2020s, kind of kind of tough. Right. Uh, so we started putting it um, just as a place to rent out on Airbnb, knowing that the place was haunted, but not in like a, you know, your hair's on fire and everything's like, you know, falling off the walls, scary. Right. Um, just what I will typify as a fairly gentle, but very physically present haunting. That very physically present aspect of the haunting led to a couple of very interesting private messages over the Airbnb app. Hmm. Uh, they were very nice about it and uh, hesitant in a couple of cases, but they had experiences. And uh, a couple of folks were not thrilled. So it just became necessary to be like full disclosure it's okay if you don't believe in ghosts, but this house is haunted. You may have experiences. Here's some of what you might experience and just know what you're getting into if you're coming here. Uh, which means that we have some regular folks that are just going to Oberlin to the, to the university there um, or the music conservatory and are just kind of in town for a weekend or something. And then we've got a lot of paranormal investigating teams that take advantage of the fact that they have running water and heat and air conditioning, which are luxuries you don't usually get in a lot of You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> For real. And cozy. <laughs> now, you said that uh, Ohio is a really uh, haunted place, but the only place that would kind of uh, weirdly, you know, would parallel that would be Louisiana. 
I mean, I don't want to say blanket it quite much like that, but I okay. will say Ohio just the land here, mm-hmm. the space, it's it's just weird. Like I'll joke that we call our Lake Erie for a reason. <laughs> right. If you if you poke around, you see how many folks who are involved in like, you know, Jim Harold of the Paranormal Podcast and you know, Raymond Buckland and the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft, like the number of people who are involved in weird stuff who grew up and lived in Ohio. Uh, it, it's a fairly high number. So there's just, there's something in the water, there's something in the air. Um, I mean, I've got theories about it, but I will say there's an awful lot of haunted locations here. Just growing up around here, you, you, you can't throw a stone without hitting something spooky. Uh, New Orleans, the French Quarter, yeah, it is one of the places that for me is as alive mm-hmm. as the space around here where I live. Now, some of that might just be that I resonate with that place better. Um, but I've been to other places that people were like, this is 100% haunted. Like the Stanley Hotel, I really didn't get a lot from. Um, and I'm that, that is not saying there's nothing going on there. I will say one thing I've learned over time is hauntings react to people as much as people react to hauntings. Some people are just the right frequency what personality, whatever, to really draw out the activity. And it will vary from place to place and person to person. And sometimes from like throughout the course of a year, Uh, like Inspiration House, um, you know, having owned it now for a while, there's, you know, it was an old farmhouse. It was people who lived there from uh, what it was. They started construction of the house in 1869. They finished in 1870. Um, And, you know, they're, rural Ohio so in the winter they just sort of you know battened down the hatches and hung around and like the house quiets down around like November and December kind of like they're snowed in and they don't really feel like going anywhere and they're just kind of getting through the winter Um, and then it like peaks back up and gets really active in uh, the summer and the fall. I neglected to say when I introduced you that you were also an occult expert but not only that you are like a crazy cat person. (laughs) <laughs> oh yes yeah uh currently we only have three we lost our main coon um last november to cancer oh. uh, but i i have i'm a cat whisperer i get along with cats better than people generally i mean maybe it's just an author thing <laughs> like uh just a, a stereotypical author with the the cats around you have bliss and is it ria ria uh, yeah, Rhea is the, the newer one. Um, mm-hmm. She she had some virus, uh, possibly COVID. It's not like they do COVID tests for cats. Um, and had just recovered from it when we got her. So she's she's got almost no sense of smell, which you wouldn't think was such a big deal for a cat. But she, she's got some challenges with like navigating the world. She does her absolute best. And she's just sort of like delightfully derpy sometimes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like you can tell she's a very smart cat, but there's just parts of the world that that she can't experience the way a cat normally would, and she's very confused by it. Now, how, what's the uh, highest number of cats at the same time have you owned? Uh, I think four. I usually have a, a rule of like a, a person to cat ratio of like right. how many people live in the house and how many cats you're allowed to have. Right. Uh, we, we had four here uh, because there were four folks you know living. There's me and my wife. Um, the, the fellow who's been my roommate since 1999, who might as well be a brother at this point, um, and someone who we, you know, had, they were in a bad situation, so we let them move in a couple of years ago, and just so they could kind of, like, get their life together, get, like, finish their degree, do, do stuff, um, and Remy ended up bonding with them, uh, we let Paul get Rhea, Um, because Paul didn't have a cat. So for a little while, we had a perfect ratio of one cat per person. Now, on your your books, you wrote the uh, Dictionary of Demons and the Psychic Mm -hmm. Vampire, the Ghost Hunter's Guide to the Occult. Mm -hmm. Which one's your favorite that you wrote? Dictionary of Demons, because of all of the ones, it's the one where I really got to bring the full force of my college degree back lately into it. Um, without making it be like a big dry academic text. Uh, you know, I, I am one of the few people active in the paranormal who learned demonology. Like I took demonology as a course in college from Jesuits. Uh, so like I, I come to it from an academic uh, standpoint 
And the Dictionary of Demons is just a, a fun ride into not just like the concept of demons, but the history of it. And I, I feel like it really lets me shine with the research that I love to do through literature and you know art and just how society and belief kind of converge to to shape how we see the world. Let's talk about your music. Now, I just recently discovered that you, you know, have music out there and do you write your own stuff or, or do you, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I listened to uh, several songs and they were just beautiful. They were different than, you know, like, like mainstream that you would hear, but it was, they were just so captivating and beautiful. So like what, what do you have to get at a, a specific state of mind when you write or, or what do you have uh, kind of steps that you have to go through? So I come from a musical family, um, my mom and my grandfather. My mom was a violinist. Um, my grandfather was a guitarist and keyboardist and we all sing. And the music is a thing that I kept for myself. So I have to be in a certain headspace to do songs. I do write the music for a lot of them. I write the lyrics for, for almost all of them. Uh, a lot of them are collaborations. Uh, so in college, we had a band called Sacrosanct, um, which was very, very like velvet drippy goth. Uh, and I founded that with my, my good friend um, and psychology lab partner, uh, Charlie Hickey, who performed under the stage name Dominic St. Charles. And we collaborated on a number of pieces together, including Angels Are Weeping, um, which is sort of like my goth power ballad. Uh, and the other folks that I do a lot of collaboration with would be uh, Knox Arcana. So Joseph Fargo of Monolith Graphics and William Pietrowski, uh, who live around here. Uh, and Vargo does uh, amazing art. Like if you do like Universal Studios, like haunted attraction stuff, you've seen his stuff uh, and you've heard his music. And with, with Vargo's stuff with Knox Arcana, weirdly, because of my work with Knox Arcana, I can say I have been on a Billboard top 10 list two years in a row. And I, I did <laughs> see that and I was really impressed. I'm like, wow. Like, hey. And all, all I did, like, they, that was a holiday album. We wanted to do, uh, like, Vargo wanted to do a thing that was not just like super cheery Christmas carols, but like the, the ones that had like a more somber tone to them, like God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, uh, the one that I sang at his request was past time with good company, a couple of like older, like medieval madrigals and whatnot. Um, and just, I, I love, I love singing. Um, it's a way of like really releasing like emotions and ideas that don't fit neatly in words otherwise. Like there's just sort of like open, you know, your heart up and it just pours out. Now you were saying that your mom played the violin. Is there an instrument that you play? I, pl I can play piano and flute. Um, I am best used with my voice. Um, at this point, I'm very, very out of practice with the flute. When my mom passed uh, to honor her memory, I tried to learn her violin. And then I decided that the absolute best way to honor her memory was to not touch her violin again. Got you. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Strings are not my are not my thing. Like if I, I can pick up anything that's a woodwind and probably figure out how to how to get some sort of melody out of it in a couple of hours. Um, read read instruments as well. <clears throat> so I've I've played clarinet, I've played saxophone. Um, I am less thrilled with brass, but it's more because of just like the embouchure, the way it makes my mouth feel. Mm -hmm. um, but strings just evade me. Um, my grandfather was very just, he wanted me to like, you know, be able to play guitar with him. And it's just, it's not my thing. Well, you do great at singing. So there you have that. Uh, let me ask you something. Can you explain to maybe people who do not know that Swatchin, um, what a psychic vampire is? Okay. So a psychic vampire is a person who needs to regularly and actively take human vital energy in order to maintain their health and well-being. Most folks in the paranormal or in, you know, psychic circles encounter the idea of a psychic vampire as a predatory person or, or entity uh, that takes this from you without your permission. But the, the, the quality, the characteristic of being vampiric is something that some people just have. Um, and it is a thing that runs in my family. Uh, and 
most, my grandfather never called it vampirism. Um, he just understood what it was and how it worked and what it meant he had to do in terms of his relationship with energy. Uh, and, you know, I, I didn't get to find that out until I was my in my 20s. We, we complicated family things. I didn't meet him until I was in my 20s. Um, but as I was learning about my psychic abilities as a child, uh, you know, here I am in this family where it was okay to be psychic and sensitive and have dreams that come true and completely freak out when I dream about the space shuttle Challenger blowing up the night before it happened. Um, but becoming aware that there was something about my awareness of the energy of other people and, and recognizing that I was having this interaction with it, uh, that I could take it and that I, that I actually kind of needed to. Um, that was a more complicated journey. Uh, it, it sent me down some rabbit holes where at the time, the only books that described that capacity were very negative. Uh, that, you know, anybody who did this was automatically, you know, evil and horrible and there was something just wrong with them. Um, and I, that wasn't my experience. Like if I were doing it without somebody's permission, sure, that's a, that's a dick move. Um, but, you know, learning to work with people's energy and do an exchange rather than just become, you know, a classic movie vampire, uh, that was more of the thing. It functions on the exact same mechanics that giving energy with like Reiki or Hands of Light does. Like it's just that exact same mechanic in reverse. Uh, the funny thing in college was running into a first generation Chinese American I was doing research to find like, you know, do you have the word vampire for, you know, in, in, in your culture and in your language? Do you have the word psychic vampire? And like, they were like, no, we don't. Because if you have low chi, you have high chi, you just share chi and everything's fine. And I'm like, wow, my life would be way less complicated if that was <laughs> the attitude I'd been raised with. But instead I'm like here going like, does energy exist? Is this all in my head? What's going on? Right. Uh, so, so I wrote my book, The Psychic Vampire Codex, so other people didn't have to grope in the dark the way I did and sort of wrestle with the, am I a monster? Like, what's wrong with me? Nothing. You're just, it's like, um, you know, it's like being neurodivergent now. Like, we used to look at things like that as like this great stigma. Um, you know, it's a horrible thing. There's something wrong with you. You're broken. As opposed to some people were just different. And that's not necessarily bad or wrong. It just means that they interface with the world differently. And it's um, really nothing wrong with that. You know, everybody, like you said, everybody's different. And I think that it's good, like you said, it's kind of a give and take situation instead of being like, because uh, you think you, you hear psychic vampire and you think of somebody just sucking the life out of you or all, depleting your energy when it's not necessarily yeah. the case. I mean, the key is consent. And the thing is, is we don't think about consent in every case, like energy healing. I've met plenty of uh, very well-meaning, like Reiki practitioners, like they're, they're just like really, really, they just learn a new maneuver and they like walk up to you without even asking and start just like beaming energy at you to heal you. And it's the exact same thing. Like they did not ask for my consent. They are doing a thing that is, that is affecting me. Uh, so whether you give or take or read someone, you know, anything that is going to impact them personally, ask for their permission, like make sure they're okay with it before you do it. Uh, if you don't, that's an attack, whether you're giving or taking. I like that. That is a good philosophy. Um, where do you see yourself like in like five years, 10 years? I mean, slowly scaling back. I mean, I'm not quite retired at this point, but I will say that after 20 plus years of bopping around the country to conventions and haunted locations and everything, I really like sleeping in my own bed. Yeah. Uh, and like the whole shutdown with the pandemic really drove that home. Like I, so many people languished when they couldn't leave the house. And I was like, oh, finally quiet. I can read all the books. I was like Burgess Meredith from that old classic uh, Twilight Zone. You know, time enough at last, I can read anything I want. Right. <laughs> um, so I see myself probably reading more books. Um, I've been doing um, like creative projects that just, that are just there because I take joy in doing them. Uh, so I, I make little games and I create these uh, little journaling journaling experiences. Like I just did one called Feast of Ravens that is uh, an exploration of like an afterlife journey. And you know it, it, it tells a story, but it also challenges the person who's reading it to like think about like what 
what decisions would I make if I was moving from one life and moving on to the next and I had to give up parts of myself? Like, how do I change? How do I grow? Um, so playing a little bit more with my fiction, with my games, um, you know, with different like hybridized art projects and I don't know, letting myself relax into that. The world is yours. I mean, it's just out there. And I mean, you're so creative and, and there's very, a lot of uh, avenues that you can take that, you know, would be good artistically, like you said. Now, do you cook or, or does your wife, she cooks mostly or? Uh, my wife's idea of cooking is opening a can uh, right. <laughs> with without shame or, or like anything right. like that. Uh, I, I, I actually enjoy cooking a lot. Um, I love working with different types of spices. Uh, and I also like like anything that it's like alchemy. Like it's it's like magic. Uh, I love baking much to the uh, detriment of everybody's waistlines around here. What's your specialty? Brownies. Brownies? I like to make... Um, my, my legendary brownies involve uh, a little bit of chambord uh, and then a thin ribbon of like sour cream, or not oh. sour cream, um, cream cheese. Oh, cream. well, that's even better, cream cheese. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah not, not sour cream, a, basically like a little, little cream cheese yeah. ribbon uh, with raspberry jam and then in the batter is chambord. So it's like this, it, it like dark chocolate and then like the sharpness of the raspberry and it just pops. Hey, everybody. I want to uh, talk to you about our sponsors of Quest. We have Chef Ron's Gumbo Stop in Metairie, Louisiana. The best gumbo. It is an award-winning gumbo by an award-winning chef. Fabulous bread pudding, red beans, everything you want. Be sure to sh check out ChefRon'sGumboStop.com. And we also have Area 51 Gallery and uh, Rocket will take care of your merch needs for your business. Your, if you're having a party, an event, your organization. I mean, he does the quest buttons for us. And so it's really cool. And be sure just to reach out at Area 51 Gallery and talk to Rocket, and he will hook you up. Also, we have Louisiana Pizza Kitchen Uptown. Wonderful place to eat. It is right there by the river bend. They have a wonderful patio where you can eat outside. It's just really lovely. On Wednesday nights, it's family and friends night where all adult beverages, including bottles of wine, are half off. So you know I'm there. And be sure uh, to try my favorite, the Thai curry. No, not the Thai curry. The Thai chicken pasta. And uh, just tell them that Misty sent you. And then we have Louisiana Spirits. They are a paranormal group here in the state of Louisiana, and they are statewide, and they do wonderful investigations. They just uh, hosted the first ever Cajun Country Paracon that was in New Iberia this last weekend, and Brandon and I and Catherine, we went and set up, had a wonderful time, got to meet a lot of wonderful people in the paranormal field. So be sure to check out Louisiana Spirits. Thank you. I really appreciate you being on the show. Um, it's like I said, it's a huge honor for me. I've been following, um, you know, you for a long time, and I hope that you'll want to come back and and uh, visit with us again. And if you're ever y'all are ever out this way in New Orleans, you know, let us know. And um, I mean, it's only 16 hours away from. Uh, I've got Ohio. friends down there. New Orleans is one of those cities where it feels like a second home to me. It calls to me. Yeah. I actually have um, Acadian French family in Lafayette. Oh, okay. Uh, so, like, there's, I've got roots down there. There's a reason why that space speaks to me. But I don't, I don't know if you know, like, New Orleans as a city, like, she decides who gets to, who gets to stay. And my experience with New Orleans, I'm allowed to visit. Okay. I'm not allowed to live there. Like, like she, she can only tolerate me mucking around in her <laughs> little ghost world for so long. I think, um, which is fine. But you know, I really do love that city. There's so many things about it. I mean, Frenchman Street oh, and yeah. the, and just the art, uh, the tarot readers, uh, and just New Orleans, especially the French Quarter, is one of the few places on earth where, if I'm walking down the street, I genuinely am not sure if the person I'm looking at is physically a person or is a spirit because it is so so thick there it's just I've, I've had experiences that I don't think I could have had anywhere but the French Quarter in New Orleans and they're 
It's, it's a very different world. I love it. And you're right because, I mean, New Orleans, like I always say, it gets in your heart. And yeah, like I've been here like 20 something years and, and I just, I don't even think about, you know, living anywhere else because it just gets a hold of you. And I oh. just love it here. So. Oh, speak, speaking of the music, I, I hope you heard Bitter Ashes. I did. Was, Bitter I, Ashes. I, I did. Yes. Yeah, Quiem for, for Katrina because, oh, wow, that. Yeah, I was here during that, and that was that's definitely a whole nother story about. That. No, I I've got friends with so many stories, some really harrowing ones. Friends who ended up in Houston because they were in the, they ended up getting stuck in the stadium, and those are stories that we will leave for a completely different podcast because they are yes. really traumatic. Yes, they are. Um, I want to leave you with with some of your words here. Um, echoes i seem to have echoes in my mind have forgotten memories of ancient time what are they from where do they come maybe from another life overlapping this one that's thought-provoking and so true so everybody be sure that you can uh, get michelle's books on amazon or go to uh michelle belanger on belanger on dot com is that right yeah, Michelle Belanger, if you want to figure out how to spell it, just think uh, Bell Anger. Um, Bell Anger, is, yes. Is that, that last name. Uh, and yeah, all of my books, all of the games, like pretty much everything is like, we just sort of like made it a, a one-stop shop. Um, I make handmade incense. There, there's honestly probably an overwhelming amount of stuff because I'm always doing something. Okay. And I can see that because, I mean, You've always did stuff, and you will continue to do that. Thank you so much for uh, being a guest on the show. It was so, like I said, such an honor and so nice to get to talk to you. And I will be back next week, everyone. And until then, see you next time.